Okay, um, my name is Martin Matuška and I would like to welcome you to my talk. Um, my to talk today will be about tuning ZFS on FreeBSD. Um, let's have a very short overview about what we are going to talk about today. So in the beginning I'll give you a very short quote about what is this all about. Then I will give you some general tuning tips, very basic ones. Then application tuning tips for several types of applications. And going on with uh, ZFS caches, that's, that's the more complicated part because the, there you have to also count and, and calculate stuff. And uh, at the very last, I will show you the statistics tools I'm using. Part of them are written by me, part of them just modified. Uh, that can give you uh, measurement and evaluation data to uh, make decisions how to tune your Z ZFS installation. So let's go on. As you know, ZFS is uh, the last word in file systems. As of the letters, we have VFS, XFS, YFS, and at the very end, ZFS. At least if you have three letters and the last two ones are FS, it's probably the last word. <laughs> uh, yes. So it is a modern 128-bit file system. Uh, it is open source, originally developed by Sun Microsystems, and it is utilizing the copy on write model. Uh, this presentation will tell us answers to two questions. First of these questions is uh, how can we tune ZFS? And uh, the second question is uh, when should ZFS be tuned at all? So if we need that or if it's not necessary. So I'll start with this help. My ZFS is slow. Um, okay, um, ZFS is slow. First of all, uh, define slow. I mean, what does it mean slow? First you have to tell uh, what does it mean to be slow? What are you comparing to? Are you comparing to the very same system yesterday? Yes, it is running for 24 hours. Yesterday it was quick. Today you have performance problems. Or you are comparing to a completely different file system on the same machine. Or you are comparing to a file system on a completely different machine with completely different hardware. And if you are doing that, then it's scientifically irrelevant, <laughs> your decisions, because uh, that can be based on, on, on these assumptions. Good, uh, well, uh, as I say, it depends on many factors, workload, data access, um, what data structures do you have on your system? Do you have many files? Do you have few files? Are your files big? Are your files small? Um, in ZFS, we always have this magic trade-off of, of data consistency and features against speed. So um, we have stuff like ZFS checksums and, and, and other, other features that cost processing time and make your system slower than if you are using a file system that doesn't use these, these features. Um, another point is it might happen that auto-tuning may not be your case. So if you have special, not standard environments where you are, for example, having a heavy utilized web server with 30 million files, what was my case, uh, then the standard settings are not uh, optimal for your installation. Okay. Um, the first thing I want to say is always think twice about what you do and what you said. I have here quotes from two blogs on the internet. First is a blog by, by some guy who uh, writes about uh, speeding up ZFS on FreeBSD. And among other, other things, he has here disabled uh, unwanted features. So uh, I'm really quoting him. This is what's on the blog. And uh, he says, you know, uh, if you don't need checks and disable them. And on his blog also, if you look at his optimization strings, there is, uh, I don't need checks, checksums for why are there for that therefore. So ZFS disable checksum on the, on the whole system. And he's using a mirror or RAID Z data set. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, um, another blog that's from Nexenta. 
also for tuning on an Accenta system, and that says a note on disabling ZFS checksum don't. <laughs> So that there are two different opinions. Uh, if you want to hear what, what's my opinion about this, um, yes. If I disable checksums on ZFS, then it's, it looks probably like this. And uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, that's like shuffling my own, own grave. Uh, because checksum is one of the, one of the very important features that, that helps you keep your data integrity in ZFS. So each block of data is being checksummed, and these checksums are compared always uh, every time you access this data. So, so if something changes on your disk without, without the knowledge of the system, the system is aware of this. Another point, if you have RAID Z or mirror installations, you have the self-healing fe feature. Uh, that means that if the data gets corrupted on one disk, the system automatically uh, replaces the corrupted data with the data that matches the checksum from the, from the other device. We'll start with a section of general tuning tips. Uh, these are really very basic ones, so nothing, nothing advanced, uh, very easy to perform. It will be about system memory, access time, data set compression, some stuff about the dedupli duplication and uh, ZFS send and receive. Uh, in one of these blogs, I have mentioned the guy, this guy who uh, recommends uh, disabling checksums. He also recommends uh, don't use RAID Z, use just mirrors because it's faster, you know. Uh, it depends what you want. If you want a lot of space, you need a RAID Z because with a mirror you always have the half of the half the space of, of, of your of your setup. And even in ZFS, I have had setups where I have a four-way mirror. That means I have just four disks running as one disk, just of the purpose of speed, so that the so that the access times get lower of all these four drives. Because SATA drives are maybe big today, but they are still not fast. I mean, compared to, again, yes, SSD drives, for example. Uh, uh, even, even the um, SAS drives have at highs, I guess, 15,000 uh, RPM. So you still, it's faster than SATA drives, but it's not as, it is not as fast as the, the bleeding edge SSDs. So let's start with random access memory. Um, ZFS is a RAM eater, so uh, the caches and other parts of the file system need random access memory. So uh, in FreeBSD we have a recommended minimum of one gigabyte, but that's really for, uh, for some kind of a really, really small home server that's doing nothing that is usable. If you, if you need serious work, you need at least four gigabyte, and I recommend using eight and more as a total memory. And from this, from this memory, uh, we'll look later how much of this memory is used for the ZFS caches. So access time. That's a topic about Unix systems I have heard for a long, long time. Um, the problem of access time is that uh, every time a file is accessed on a, on a uh, Unix file system with enabled access time, is uh, that the data is stored, that the timestamp is updated. I mean, on normal systems, non-ZFS systems, let's call them like this, it might not be such an issue. But on ZFS, let's say you have snapshots and you have lots of snapshots. I mean that now every time you access it, this, this data has to be updated compared to the snapshots. So uh, uh, many people ask themselves, why, are my, why is my space growing? I did not write one single file in my system, but I have 20 million files which are accessed daily. And I'm doing daily snapshots, and my snapshots have like hundreds of megabytes. Why is that? Yeah, and that's just uh, sorry. And what is this? <laughs> okay. So that, so that's just because uh, because of this access time feature. The access time gets updated, and the snapshots remember all changes in data and metadata. So uh, the access time change is stored in the snapshot, and in the next snapshot, the, again, new access time of the latest one before the snapshot was done, and so on. So your snapshots, snapshots take space, and the space usually may really grow if you have lots of lots of small files which are accessed uh, frequently. So data set compression, uh, well, that's a, that's a mixed story. Um, the original target of data set compression, the goal is to save space. That means that you compress your data and uh, 
you they occupy less space on your on your drive than than the byte number that's written in the data. So the size of the data, it depends how compressible this data is, and it depends on what which algorithm do you choose. Currently, only two algorithms are available: it's LZJB and LZJB and GZIP. Uh, LZJB compresses less, GZIP compresses more. But with the CPU usage, uh, LZJB uses much less CPU than GZIP, also GZIP much, much more. Um, of course, if you have a very slow device and you are reading compressed data, your relative data thro throughput increases. Um, I recommend using compression primarily for archiv archiving purposes. So for example, a disk with locks, so you just don't compress your locks with BZIP, you just disable in FreeBSD the lock compression. Have a separate data set, set GZIP, ZFS compression of the, on this data set, and the data is on the fly, uh, is compressed on the fly as, as the logs are written. Uh, there is a new compression algorithm in the works at Illumos uh, uh, that is called LZ4, and it should be twice as fast as LZJB, and it should consume even less CPU power, much less than LZJB. So I'm interested how it how this. How this, how this is going to work out. So that application. Okay, uh, if you think ZFS needs a lot of RAM, then if you are using that application, you need like the, to the power of two <laughs> of the RAM or something like that. Well, it depends on uh, how, how many blocks are you using. Because the data application uses a, uses a kind of hash table where all the, all the duplicate block data is stored. And uh, you have good performance when this hash table fits into your memory. If your memory is larger, it has to be split, and uh, part of the calculations have to be have to be out uh, outsourced, and it gets really really slow. Um, there is a magical command to the Z ZDB called ZDB minus minus S, and it does kind of a simulation: how much space would you gain if your system would be that duplicate it. So it, it's just kind of a dry run where, where the data application isn't enabled, isn't really enabled. Uh, you are, the data isn't stored once, but you get, a, uh, you get a print of a table and also the size of the table, uh, uh, how much space you will gain and how big this table will be. Um, if you are already having the duplication, then you can check the data with ZDB minus D or minus DD. That gives you detailed, detailed information about how the, the application structure works. And generally, it's recommended that it should be at least a factor of two. If you don't have a factor of two, then it's, it's not, not really uh, useful. Factor of two means that you save half of the amount of the data that's stored on your drive. OK, ZFS send and receive. As, as you might know, ZFS is able to send data sets in a stream and uh, you can store them in a file or directly receive these systems on another system. Uh, this method of direct receival on, on, on another system is used very commonly. Many people use this, for example, piping through SSH or other secured connections. And the problem is the buffering that's built in ZFS is, is, is not optimal for, for this kind of uh, data transfer. So I recommend using some kind of uh, MIT uh, buffering solution. Uh, we have in our ports, one of these called MISC buffer, and the better one is MISC M buffer, which is network capable. So you can set up M buffer on one side, uh, on another side, and just pipe through this M buffer data. You define the amount of memory that's allocated to M buffer, and the speed gains might be really big because the the, the speed uh, the data is read from uh, from the drives from the devices is not constant. So uh, you have parts where are large files you are reading quickly. You have parts where are many more small smaller files. You need more seek time and it takes more time. And sometimes the reading is faster than your network connection. Sometimes the reading is slower. So this buffer actually. Makes make such a wage between these uh, between these two situations, and you get a more constant speed. And altogether, it's faster because uh, the system has less waiting time for the connection or for the data. So, uh, application tuning tips. Um, I'm. We are going to look how to optimize for the following application. I will show some settings for the web servers, some settings for database servers, and some settings for file servers. 
So uh, before you go to the hardcore optimization, that means when nothing else helps, yeah, that's that's the possibility how this could be done. <laughs> Maybe in the past times, many machines have been optimized this way. <laughs> but today it works a little differently. Uh, so let's take a look at web servers. Uh, as of the current ZFS implementation, uh, we, have, we have a problem with this because uh, if we are using the send file call, the data is actually cached, cached twice. First in the FreeBSD inactive memory and second in the ZFS cache. So you have like twice the data in your cache and that is very bad because you're lo losing your RAM, RAM memory in a, on a, on a, on a, uh, in a quick way. Um, these four, as, as, as of the current implementation, is, is, is recommended to just disable send file because it's directly served from the ZFS cache. So you then don't have to, uh, don't have to use the FreeBSD, files, FreeBSD standard caching system in this case. Uh, this, this counts also for the MMAP in Apache. So if you apply these two settings, you will notice on your system that you, that you have much more free RAM memory and the speed will be about the same. In Nginx, uh, you just disable send file with send file off and in light HTTPD, uh, you set write v as the network backend. I have personal experience with this and I can tell you that it makes a difference. I have, had, I have administered systems that have like 48 gigabytes of RAM or even 96 gigabytes of RAM. And uh, when I have changed these settings, I look, oh, I have 30 gigabyte more free RAM. Ah, nice. <laughs> okay. Um, database servers, um, well, many people say don't run database servers from ZFS. It's generally always slower as the other file systems. It might be true. At least, at least for UFS, uh, for example, PostgreSQL is a lot faster from UFS than, than from ZFS, at least on FreeBSD. Um, um, what, what is recommended is to change the default record size because databases store their data in, in, uh, in, in chunks, consistent chunks, and uh, these chunks in PostgreSQL are by standard eight, eight kilobytes. So uh, if you set the record size to eight kilobytes, you have a more effective data set if you, than if you leave the default 128 kilobytes. Uh, the 128 kilobytes is a variable size, but the allocation is better if you, if you put it down to eight kilobytes. Doing nothing, this is just... Annoying. Okay, in MySQL, uh, for my ESAM storage, it's eight, eight kilobytes. For InnoDB storage, it's 16 kilobytes. I personally use the eight kilobyte for my MySQL installations uh, as a universal setting. Well, file servers, I have some general tips. Um, first of them is uh, disable access time if, if you don't need it. Uh, keep the number of snapshots low. If you have quite a lot of snapshots, then it gets again slower because of because of the way the data is stored. Because the the data in file server is stored relatively uh, in the snapshots. That means each snapshot remembers changes from the last snapshot. And uh, as of the experience we have, if you have really a lot of snapshots, many internal ZFS operations take longer because they have to traverse all the snapshots. So so these internal operations slow down other, uh, other data activity on your system. Um, if you want to use deduplication, only if you are sure that you have enough random access memory to do this, otherwise you have, again, a slowdown on your system. For heavy write workloads, uh, like business scale, it's recommended to uh, move the ZFS intent lock to separate SSD drives. Normally, the ZFS intent lock uh, is stored on a small part of your existing pool, of your existing devices. And uh, it's, it's something similar to the, to the journal. It's, it's uh, not, the very, not the same, but the, the functionality is very similar to the journal in journaling file systems. And if you put it on a, another drive or on fast SS3 drives, then, then uh, your write load gets, uh, gets faster. Uh, optionally, you can disable the ZFS intent lock for individual data sets. So it's, 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 it's configurable, but again, beware the consequences. You are losing the data, the integrity on a, uh, on a possible system shutdown or, or, or panic. 
So uh, we are now going to the more scientific part <laughs> of my talk, and that's tuning of cache and prefetch settings. So we are, I will going to talk about the uh, adaptive replacement cache, ARTS, that's the key point of ZFS, the key cache. Then we have the level two uh, ARC adaptive replacement cache. Uh, it's not, it's, mm, most systems are not using this feature, but again, if you are deploying larger systems, for example, with heavy red workloads, it's very useful because it increases your, it's similar to an increase in RAM, but you just have more of this, of this memory on your SSD drives. Then we have the ZFS interlock that's also, also measured and monitored. We have a feature that's called file level prefetch or ZFetch in ZFS. Then we have a device level prefetching, VDEV prefetch, and then I will show you the statistics tools I'm using. So uh, the adaptive replacement cache, um, it resides in the system write memory. It's the major speed up of ZFS. So if you disable ARC, you will see everything gets really slow in ZFS. Um, the size of the arc is auto-tuned. Let's take a look at the default values. So if we look at them, um, we, have, we have here the maximum size of your RRC is actually physical RAM less one gigabyte. So if you have like 16 gigabytes of RAM, then 15 is auto-tuned as a max maximum value for, for arc. Uh, as we can see here, or half of, mal, uh, half of all memory, so for, if you have only one gigabyte of memory, you cannot allocate one minus one gigabyte for us because you have no memory for anything else. So only half of the memory is allocated to uh, ARC. Again, we have a minimum, and uh, the minimum value is uh, 64 megabytes. So uh, here we have something called metadata limit. Your ARC memory is, is divided into two parts, one is ARC for data, another is for metadata. Uh, metadata is, uh, uh, is, is, is data about data, so there are stored information about, uh, about the files, inodes, and stuff like this. And uh, there are situations where you hit limit of this memory. So you, you take a look, you see your other values look good. I mean, you have enough RAM, there is still free ARC. But your system is slow because, because this, this, this part of the ARC memory gets filled up and it has to be replaced. So, so the data still, there are still a lot of reads on your, on your drives and you still have a lot of free ARC memory in total. So you're asking yourself, uh, how does this happen? Uh, then we have a minimum and that's, uh, uh, the standard for ARC is one fourth of the maximum. Uh, of the maximum. So if we have, again, it's a one fourth of these 15 gigabytes. Then from this metadata limit, we cut it to a half and we have the minimum for the ARC. Uh, ARC, when, when your system is running, this ARC is auto-tuned. Uh, it cooperates with, with the VM memory pressure in, in, in FreeBSD. So if, if, if ARC needs more memory, it allocates more, more memory, but this, all of this is kernel memory, of course. Uh, and uh, if, 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 if other parts of the system need this memory, then it's again freed, but only up to the minimum. So it, it actually moves between the minimum and the maximum. And on a, on a busy system, it will be always close to the maximum or some kind of equilibrium chosen between the VM pressure and the, and the memory arc uh, is ready to release. Uh, I will show you this in these statistics tools. So uh, first of all, how, how can we tune this ARC? Uh, you can, ARC can be disabled on a data set level. That means you can tell, you can say this data set do not use ARC, and you can say this data set use only ARC for metadata. There are two options you can, you can set. Uh, again, it might be useful if you are short of memory on, or if you really explicitly need to reserve your ARC for only a specific group of data sets. Um, the maximum can be limited to reserve memory for other tasks. Many people do this and it might be useful on, on several types of systems. For example, if you are using TMPFS and uh, you want this memory allocated to MPFS to be always there, you don't want ZFS to grow its arts to be uh, arc memory too big, you can just cut the maximum and, and uh, save, save this memory for other uh, purposes. Um, 
As I said again, increasing this meta limit might be useful if you have a lot of metadata, that means, for example, lots of files. If you have really like 30 million files, in our case, increasing this value made a big change on, on how the system performed. Okay, L2 arcs, that's the level two arc. Uh, some facts about it, it's designed to run on fast block devices, SSD. Uh, it helps primarily on read intensive workloads. So if you are deploying a, a Samba server in, some, uh, in a company where you have like 50 to 50 read write workload, uh, L2 arcs is not, not, the, not the thing for you. But if you are deploying a web server that, has, that, that works like write once, read many, uh, then SSD is a very, very practical. And we have done this with uh, about uh, 300 gigabytes of SSD storage. And this was used very efficiently. So we have been very happy with it. Um, L2 arc, the, the arc, the system's arc, is the same arc for all pools on your system. So all pools on your system are sharing the same memory region. For L2 arc, each of these SSD devices or device groups, you can also make a mirror, is devoted to one special pool. That means you can have several devices for several pools and you are just limiting this to, to these pools. And like arc, on this pool, you can make pair data set settings that only this data set is using the memory and other data sets are not using the secondary uh, level cache. Okay, um, how to tune this memory? Um, first, first of all, uh, by default, uh, the prefetch for L2 arc was disabled, and for us, this this was very hurting hurting us. So we had to change it uh, to on again. This, this this the setting is VFS ZFS L2 arc no prefetch is a loader conf setting. And uh, if you are doing streaming servers, like streaming large files or, or video files, then I recommend turning this on because it's, it, it's, a, it's a huge performance gain. And the L2 arc doesn't work really well if it's not, if it's not set. Um, there is a um, period called turbo warm-up phase. What is this? Um, because SSD drives uh, cannot be rewritten forever. They are, they, are, they are getting lost. Uh, the engineers of, of, of Sun had thought to just lower the speed at, at which the L2 arc is written on the drives. And uh, there are two phases. There is the standard writing phase, that's the write max, and there is a turbo phase, it's called write boost. Uh, by standard, they have set these settings to eight megabytes. That means uh, in the standard situation, only eight megabytes per second can be written to the L2 arc. And that this may be a bottleneck on your system. And in this turbo phase, they have set in again to eight megabytes. So in the beginning of the system, uh, this, this warm up phase actually happens to the first moment where memory is evicted from L2 arc. That means until memory, memory has not been evicted, it's the turbo phase. And when the first memory gets evicted, we have the standard situation. So in this turbo phase, these two values, again, loader conf uh, settings are added. So this is eight megabyte by standards. This is eight megabytes. So we have a write of 16 megabytes per second, which is which might be of, for two days SSDs that's slow. So I recommend setting these to higher values, higher values, at least 16, 16, or 32, 32, or even, even faster. But again, the idea of this was to prevent these SSDs to drain quickly. But the technology of SSDs is improving every year. So as of today, these eight, uh, eight megabyte settings correspond to, to the situation of like four years ago. So the SSDs have developed since then. So I recommend setting higher values. So ZFS intent lock, uh, it guarantees the data consistency on, on F-Sync calls, uh, replace trans transactions in case of a panic or a power failure of the system, and uh, in general uses the small storage space on, on the pool, as I already told. And to speed up writes, uh, it can be placed on a separate device. Um, as you can see here on, on this line, um, there is a per data set setting. You can set sync to standard, always, or disabled. Uh, that's the pair data set synchronicity. Uh, if you set to disabled, then it's, it's not used at all the, the, in the intent lock. That means you have no data integrity. And uh, um, 
I personally don't use this, but some, some users recommend that there might be some situation for some parts of the drives where this might be useful. Uh, setting this to always uh, means that on every F-Sync uh, data gets not written to the log, but to the disk, always. So it gets to the log and to the disk, and that's very slow. So this is really for hardcore data consistency applications, where you really need it to be written not just in the log in the system, but exactly already in place when the, when the F-Sync call returns. Uh, the standard setting is sufficient for, for most people. I'm using only the standard setting on my systems. So file level prefetching. Um, uh, file level prefetch analyzes read patterns of files. Uh, it tries to predict next reads. And the goal is to, read, to reduce application response times. Uh, there is a loader tun tunable to enable on and disable ZFetch. Many people recommend disabling it. I will show you later in my statistics tools. You can measure how efficient is ZFetch on your systems. And according to this data, you can make the decision to disable it or not to di disable it. We have device level prefetch. Uh, device level prefetch is... Uh, uh, is used to when, when you read small chunks from a device. The intention of this is actually for s slow devices that have a bad access time. That means if you read just a small chunk, device level privilege actually reads from this device more data specified in, 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 this, in this variable. So this was, this, has, this was usually set to 10 megabytes. It's, it's a static allocated kernel memory at boot. And uh, when you set this memory, then uh, uh, then reading like four kilobytes, or a, there is also a uh, there is also a threshold that can be also set, but that's a byte shift value value. And uh, when when the reads are under this threshold, then like ten megabytes are read from the data instead of just like four kilobytes. Uh, the idea is that there are less seeks on the drive and you have more more data available on this on this one one read um, the problem was uh, people have been using zfs for appliances and these appliances have had a lot of drives and and if you have like 32 64 or even more drives in a big appliance you multiply this with 10 megabytes you are just losing this memory already at the beginning because it's statically allocated it cannot be used for anything else and uh, that might be quite a large amount for a, for a big number of drives. On a small system, uh, there is no real reason to disable it, but it has been disabled by, DB, by default. So again, what you can do, you can try to enable it and use the statistical measurement tools to take a look how effective, how, ef how efficient is it on your system. So uh, the statistical, statistical data in ZFS is provided by uh, CCTL knobs. Uh, it's called the it's, it's actually by Pavel Jakub Davidek, the KSTAT framework. He has imported it. And this KSTAT framework gives you a, a lot of counters, a lot of statistical data, a lot of values. Uh, these VFS, ZFS are, are statical values, and these are collected values. So this is, this is the current state, how much is what, and here are, here are collectors. Um, this data can help you make tuning decisions. And this is quite important because just tuning because somebody else says, uh, yes, this might be good, uh, that's no scientific way to do things. And uh, uh, it's, it's much better if we make some measurements. Uh, I will show you two tools. First of them is called ZFS Stats, and the second one is called ZFS Moon. Both tools are available in port under Sysutils ZFS Stats. So ZFS stats is based on Ben Rookwood's Arc Summary PL for Solaris and includes modi modifications by Jason G. Helenthal and myself. Uh, it gives you an overview about how your systems look like looks like now and what happened since the system boot. Uh, it also has several command line flags. If you use the minus H flag, you have a help that shows you what is possible, or if you run it without arguments. And uh, it shows you the structure of your memories and how, 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 how filled they are. Here is a sample output of this. So here we have the arc size. Um, yeah. Here we can see it's 25 gigabytes. It's the target size. We have the minimum size. It's 4 gigabytes. And the maximum size is 32 gigabytes in this case. On this system, the arc memory was limited 
the system had a total of 48 gigabytes RAM, and we have limited the ARC to 32 gigabytes of RAM. As we can see, the ARC is used up to 80%. And then we have efficiency since boot time, so it's a collected value. And there we can see it's, it's 90%, and we have a 10% miss ratio for ARC. Um, there are also demand and prefetch efficiencies. Then we have the L2 arc breakdown, and again we have a heat ratio of 62.89%, uh, a miss ratio for 37.13%. If you want to collect, if you want to calculate your total efficiency, you have to take this value, that's the miss ratio of the arc, and this, this value is actually split here in L2 arc. So, so from this 10%, 62% are read from the L2, from the level 2 memory, and these 37% have to be read from the drives. So, so it's, it's probably about 6%, so your total efficiency is about 96% in this, in this system. Uh, this is an example output of ZFS stats. It's very useful to give you like a statistical, uh, static overview of your current system, but people are more interested on, on what is going on now. That means not what is since the system was booted, because like for example, the first week there was no utilization, and now in the last week we have a lot of X data access and drives. So I have a second utility that's called ZFS Mon um, that pulls ZFS counter counters in real time and analyzes this data and gives you real time absolute and relative values. Again, there are again there are lots of flags, and my inspiration for this tool was varnish stat from the varnish project project <laughs> you might, most of you maybe know this or many of you um, so the output is is exactly like varnish stats output it looks like this so we uh, but this is the extended version i mean you can you can just have a very very low output you just that shows you just the efficiencies there are a lot of flex you can change this you can even tell the system that collect the data for 120 seconds and then just output, out, output the statistics. So here we, can see, we see like in varnish stat, that means this is statistics for the last second. That means how, how does this, what, does, what did the system do in the last second? Then we have an average for the last 10 seconds, for the 60 seconds, and a total since the, since the, since the command was running. Uh, we have this for absolute values. That's here, that's, that's really how many hits have been counted. And here we have relative values. That means what is the efficiency percentage compared, for example, hits against misses and so on. So here we have uh, in the 10 seconds it was 91%, in 60 seconds it was less, and as a total it was about 90% in two minutes running time, 120 seconds. Um, yes? What? Uh, you actually do tuning after you run this. So this is before any tuning? You run this before any tuning, yes. Example? What? This example? this example is from the same system as before. That means you have an arc limitation. The L2 arc prefetch is enabled. Uh, for example, from, from this setup, we might ask yourself the question, uh, is zfetch, that means file viewer prefetch, useful for me? So we take a look at mean at least in the last two minutes, we have here an efficiency of 92.92%. That's, that's, that's quite nice. I mean, I would use ZFetch by, with, this pref with, with, this, with this efficiency. Uh, for L2 arc, it is quite a lot lower. We have here 71%. Uh, um, I usually never manage very high efficiencies with L2 arc, but on my systems, I have been happy if it's over 70% in the long run. For L2 arc, it's okay. For arc, it's not okay. For ARC, you need a higher, a higher efficiency, uh, like here, 90%. Okay, so this is about the statistic tools, and now I'm open to questions. So I let this open, and if anyone has questions, I would like to answer them. Yes? More of a comment. Um, back when Sun was developing ZFS, they found bad hardware, bad memory, bad disk controller firmware, all with the checksums in VMS. So disabling the checksum in VMS, you should really question the veracity of anybody who makes that advice. I mean, it's 
it's a big part. At Checksum, it's a big part of what ZFS is. Uh, that's why I showed this example as a bad example. That means he puts this on the blog. There are lots of comments from a lot of people. Uh, but the idea of this was just don't trust anybody in any blog you find on the internet because uh, uh, many people look at the internet that what's written, you know, that's holy. So uh, that's, that's, not, that's not the point it should look like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, other questions? Yes? Did you boot from ZFS on your servers? Did you boot all, all the servers are full ZFS servers. That means they boot from ZFS, they run this data from ZFS and so on. So there's really only ZFS as file system. Yes. Uh, which of the tunables are, uh, is it possible to tune on the running system and which require a reboot? <laughs> uh, there is a very low number of tunables that is, that is tunable on a, on a running system. Um, one of the tunables I didn't mention that, that, uh, that can be changed uh, is the threshold for the TXG writing time that can be used on, on write, write workloads. It's, the auto-tuning of this available is, is, is quite uh, good. There are some cases where you want to set this fixed value that means that after, after the TXG accumulates a specific amount of memory, it is written to the drive. In the, in the past, this was some, somehow badly implemented, so we have been heavily using this, uh, this, tuning, this tuning setting, um, because uh, maybe many of you in the past experienced ZFS like uh, a pulsing write. That means your system is running, and now it is writing for, for like five seconds. Then again, nothing happens, and then again, it's writing for five seconds. This was happening at ZFS, and this tunable was able to, to, to change this behavior. But in the recent versions, this has been fixed in the internals, so that doesn't really happen anymore, at least on FreeBSD. But there are a very few, and uh, mostly, mostly with, from, from CCTL, you can actually look, or in the, in the header files, in the, in the source files, you can take a look exactly which ones are, are configurable. It's a very, very low number. Most of them are hard-coded uh, memory sizes, and you can change, you can make changes to this kernel memory on the, on the running system because it's not safe. Other questions? I have a system that has a lot of very small files, and I noticed that the meta limit I yes. exceed it. Like the meta limit, I have a 16 gig arc, so the meta limit is four gigabytes. Yes. But currently, I'm using 13 gigabytes of meta cache. Is there something I can do to lead you, more arc, or uh, you want more metadata cache or less? <laughs> uh, I have more, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yes. Uh, if you can hear, you have here the metadata usage. Yes, the demand and the prefetch metadata. And, and, and here, 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 as we can see, it's poor. Yeah. The efficiency values are really poor. So, so from this system, I would tell it is full, and I need to increase the limit. Okay. But again, you have to reboot the system to make this accurate. Right, but in my system, I, the, it's you have already changed it. Well, no, I, I didn't change the limit, but the amount it's using is three times the limit. The limit's not actually happening. Uh, then that, that this might be a bug in the ZFS implementation. Might be. I'm not experiencing this, but I have read in the forums that some people do experience this. So, how much is your total memory? Uh, on the yes. Uh, 48 gigabytes. 48 gigabytes. And, and the number of files you are serving? Uh, 12 million. That's even less than we have been doing, but we have right. never experienced this. Okay. So, it, it was never higher than the, than the limit number. Right. But I know Andre Gapon was also looking at this AVG in FreeBSD, and he found there some, some, some settings that have been bad. So it was really possible to, to allocate more memory than this limit, because some calculations had, I guess, an off by one error or something like okay. this in, in our case. Uh, you have mentioned that some defaults are quite conservative, like the writing speed to SSDs. Yes. Uh, do you plan to change them in FreeBSD? Do you plan to shift these defaults to more modern values? To change these defaults, um, um, our general policy, at least of now, is to follow the vendor. Because the more changes we make, the more different we are, uh, the more problems we have porting new changes from, from all of us. So currently, we didn't, have, we, we didn't make any decision to change these values. So it's, it's left up to the user. But uh, we should probably document this somewhere, at least on the wikis, that this is also important for the L2 cache. 
Again, this affects only the speed. So, so how, much, how long does it take for you to make this cache full? For example, you can say, I want it to be quickly full, but then I want to save the drives, so you could just increase this value for the, warm, for the turbo. And when the cache is full, then, it, then the uh, next writes are really on a, on a slow basis as a, as a maximum. Uh, the problem is that most users will not get to the details. And they will just say that the DFS is not fast enough. Mm. Yes, well, it, it depends. If you are making a setup for, for a huge company serving many web servers, many clients, where, where lots of like hundreds, thousands, or millions of dollars are, flo are flowing, I, I, I would expect from, from a, a contractor or somebody who sets up my servers that they also look at details like this. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I would expect this from my, uh, from, from my contractors or from my very own department. Because if it's an it's a, if it's not important a not important machine that simply don't care I mean that that makes no sense because you just have to invest money and you never get it back, but uh, on these heavy utilized systems every percent of uh, of of, of uh, speed you get has a very positive effect on your revenues, <laughs> so it's it's just a business view at least at least of of me. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Or otherwise, any hardware recommendations based on your experience? Of, uh, we have been usually using really only SATA and SAS arrays. Um, uh, in some of our systems, we have been even avoiding the RAID Z combination. So we have really had uh, RAID 5 array and or RAID 6, and on this array, we have set up ZFS just because of the caching features. Uh, but um, uh, many appli appliances are sold with this, with this setup. The question is, if your system is an appliance and at the very same time web server and, uh, and, and other, other services, if this mix is if efficient for you or not. But from, from the hardware, if you have a, a big bunch of so a JBOD of a lot of SATA drives, that, that's fully sufficient. The problem in FreeBSD, at least at current, is that we have we are missing this fault daemon. Um, uh, Xin Li has been working on this, it's called ZFSD. The idea is that there is some kind of a message framework that if a drive fails, you get noticed about this in FreeBSD uh, from the, that the ZFS communicates somehow that there is some daemon that really monitors this. In Solaris, you have, the, you have the SMF, the Solaris Management Framework that really informs you about every event that happens. Uh, in, in, in FreeBSD, we don't, don't have this for ZFS. But I guess other parts of the system might, may, might also miss this feature. It could be somehow standardized. <laughs> yeah, other questions? Uh, what do you want to benchmark? Uh, basic, uh, thank you. Um, just uh, speed, megabytes per second, let's say, for different you can use sizes. The, you can use the very common tools, uh, like uh, yeah. uh, Bonnie Benchmark or, or other, other benchmarking tools that yeah. are available. I mean, it's, it's, it's the very same benchmarking like, like others. I don't know if <laughs> special benchmarking to brittle for ZFS that, you know, tweaks. <laughs> and <laughs> makes better data for ZFS, that doesn't make sense. Okay. So I'm, I'm talking here mostly about uh, tuning tools and collecting statistics and what to, what to set and where. Okay. okay, thanks. Thank you for the question. Okay, so I guess that's it. Thank you for your attention.